here in uh, Mark chapter 2. Start with verse 23. <clears throat> One Sabbath, uh, Jesus was going through the grain fields and His disciples walked along. They began to pick some heads of grain and the Pharisees said to them, Look, love that word, look. <clears throat> you ever had somebody say that to you? Now look, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? He answered, have you never read? Now I want you to listen to what Jesus says here. So he pulls Old Testament scripture uh, out and he hands it to them. A scripture where David, who is the hero of heroes as far as the Jews are concerned. And he says, I want you to notice what David does, how he breaks the, the law, so to speak, in order to take care of the needs of himself and his men. So he says, um, uh, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions uh, were hungry and in need in the days of Abiathar the high priest? He entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for the priests to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. And then he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Another time he went into the synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. And some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. And Jesus said to them, and said to the man with a shriveled hand, stand up in front of everyone. And Jesus asked them, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they remained silent. He looked around at them in anger and deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts. And he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out and his hand was completely restored. Now, let me just ask a question. Do you think that Jesus could have just completely, nonchalantly, quietly from across the room healed this guy's hand. So the guy's there, he's, he's got a shriveled hand, and everybody's saying, I wonder if he's going to heal this guy. And Jesus is, and you know, I know they did, probably didn't have pews in church building like we have, but you know, for the time being, just bear with me. So they're sitting in pews, and, and they're doing the typical synagogue thing, and one guy there with a shriveled hand, and and, and everybody is kind of whispering in church. You, you know how that goes. We're, you know, kind of whispering, I wonder if he's going to heal this guy. There's this controversy brewing. I wonder if, wonder if he's going to do something. Now, I, my belief is that Jesus could have healed this guy from 100 miles away. In fact, we've even seen some cases in the life of Jesus where uh, a daughter of a very powerful man was uh, ill and uh, Jesus heals the daughter from, from miles away. So I, there, there was no reason, no reason under the sun why Jesus would say to this guy to stand up in the middle of the congregation, okay? None. N not only that, but why ask him to stretch out his hand? Stand up and stretch out your hand. So, you know, everybody's... What do you suppose everybody's focused on about this time? It's the extension of this hand, and Jesus heals this guy. Now, the absolutely mind-boggling thing about this whole event is not that, that they... Well, here's the mind-boggling thing. The mind-boggling thing is that these folks didn't even see the miracle. They were so bent on the controversy of Jesus doing some work on the Sabbath day that they missed the fact that he miracleized this guy's hand. I just invented a new word, so you guys deal with it. He, he, just, he just healed this guy who had a, a withered hand right in front of everybody and it zipped right past these folks because they were so intent on having a controversy over what you can do and what you can't do on the Sabbath day. I need to stress this one fact, and I know you guys are staring at the opening screen instead of the slide you're supposed to be on, so. Uh, 
I know it's a, it's a joke. It's a pun. It's a John Dennis joke. But we're going to talk about paradigm shift. And yes, there's a paradigms up there. So just, uh, yeah, I know. Everybody can go ahead and boo now. And then we can uh, get on about the business. Mark chapter 2, verse 23 and following is not at all unusual in the discussion of the life of Jesus. He consistently goes in and deconstructs and reconstructs uh, people's paradigm. And uh, I want to talk for a m moment about what a paradigm is, but I want to talk about the deconstruction and reconstruction for just a second. So he, th there are four basic, and there's probably more than this, but there are four basic themes in this deconstruct, reconstruct thing that's going on consistently in the life of Jesus. He is consistently deconstructing four basic paradigms and reconstructing them in a completely different way. And then I'm going to talk about paradigm in just a minute. But I, I just want to touch on these. The first one is this idea that the Jews, for instance, were very uh, ethnocentric. They believed that God's entire world revolved around the Jews. And that if things weren't right with the Jews, they just weren't right with God either. And so Jesus comes along and from the very beginning begins to introduce this idea that it doesn't matter what your ethnicity is. God loves you anyway. And it was so stunning to these people that Jesus would interact with, for instance, the Samaritan woman at the well. How in the world? I mean, that is, that is one of the kind of pinnacle uh, stories in the Gospel of John is this discussion. And the reason I say it's a pinnacle story is because there's only one place in the entire Bible where Jesus says, I'm the Messiah. Well, now I, I, I'm sure he said that other times, but it's only recorded one time in the entire Bible. And he was talking to a Gentile, a Samaritan woman at a well, not even in Palestine at the time. So, pretty important piece of scripture. All of it deconstructing this idea that God needs my ethnic group to really get the job done. Let me tell you something. God doesn't need the United States. The United States needs God. Okay? So, He's not like really lucky to have us on His team. You understand what I'm saying? He... He is doing us an enormous favor by tapping us on the shoulder and saying, I'd like to have you on my team. Okay? So there's that, ethnic, that, that ethnicity thing. There's, th there's this thing that Jesus is constantly breaking down and reconstructing. The idea that it's not about right action, it's about a right heart. And we have missed it in the church in the 21st century. We still think that Christianity is about stuff you do and stuff you don't do. And, and, uh, and Jesus begins from the very beginning deconstructing that paradigm and reconstructing in a way that says it doesn't really matter what you do. It matters to God. It matters what's in the heart. Okay? The third one is this idea that there's a lot of folks with nasty pasts and ongoing struggles. We are very cool with the idea of Dan standing up and confessing that he used to have a problem with anger. Okay? That's fine with us. But we do not like for people to stand up and say, I currently am having a real problem with anger. Right? We, we, we like the idea of somebody saying, well, I used to be, uh, you know, fill in the blank, but God worked in my life and now I'm... But the idea that we've got ongoing struggles, that we're, we're even as we speak wrestling with, you know, well, Christians don't do... Let me tell you, Christians do to do whatever it is that you are about to say. And God works patiently in their lives. And Jesus deconstructs this idea that God's only interested in the people who've kind of got it made spiritually. And uh, the last one, 
It's not about a political movement. That's what the Jews thought. They thought that Jesus, that the Messiah was going to come and create this political structure and liberate the Jews from the Romans. Um, God's not really into politics. I, I know that's kind of weird uh, coming from uh, a conservative guy, but the, the, the truth of the matter is... Uh, God kind of thinks he probably ought to be ruling, you know, as opposed to uh, us trying to figure out who we're going to put on the throne. God says, you know what, how about letting me rule? How, how about letting me sit uh, on the throne? Not only of the United States, but on the uh, throne of your life. So when I talk about a paradigm shift, when I talk about a paradigm um, that's not two dimes, um, it, it has to do with a pattern or a model, and it, it often has to do, when we, when we talk about a paradigm, we, a lot of times we talk about a paradigm shift. And uh, there's a lot of ways to describe this. It, there's upheaval that comes as a result of a shift in paradigm uh, on a regular basis. Um, when, we, when we change the way we think about uh, doing something or think about a thing, a real good illustration of this would be a camera. Uh, when I grew up, in fact, and, and this is a true statement, though, I was trying to find uh, this and I couldn't find it in our home, so my wife, in her wisdom, may have uh, thrown all this in the trash. But we used to have a drawer full of undeveloped film. Now, for those of you, you know, who uh, aren't my age, that we used to have a camera that we would open up the back and we would put a roll of uh, film in it, and then we would stretch the film in there, and we'd close the camera back up, and then we would take the pictures. And you, you could only get like 24 or 48 pictures on a roll, and then you'd roll the thing back up and take the, the little canister of film out, and then you would, I, don't know, I know this is weird, that's the way we did it back in the old days. We would take it to a developer, and the developer would would create these little, uh, they're called prints. You didn't even have to have a computer because there was no computer. Um, couldn't share it on that Facebook thing. You couldn't, you know, it was just a print. You know, in, or in order for you to show somebody your grandkids, you had to have the print in hand, okay? And then IBM introduced this IBM PC and things started kind of, changing about the way we think about lots of things. But one of the things that began to change was the way we think about photography. And somebody came up with this idea of a digital camera where you take the picture and it goes you know, right onto the camera. I mean, right, right into the camera's memory and then you put it right on the computer and, and uh, then you can share it with your friends via email or whatever. Now, the bizarre thing to me is that if you were the president of a company by the name of Kodak, when the first digital camera came on the scene, don't you think you might have had maybe like a, oh, I don't know, a business meeting where you said, hey, I think this is here to stay and maybe we ought to go into making digital cameras maybe or something. You know, just last year, I think it was last year, it may have been the year before, but I mean, with just in the last 48 months, Eastman Kodak made the news. You know why they made the news? They, they, <laughs> they filed bankruptcy. They were one of the largest corporations in the United States, and now they're gone. The reason they're gone is because they did not have the ability to change with the paradigm shift. Same kind of thing with uh, uh, books. Um, you used to, when I was a kid, you know, in order to buy a book, you had to go to, what do you call it, a um, bookstore. And now we've got three of the tablet gizmos in our house, and all you have to do to buy a book, and I am not kidding you, it's so amazing. It's like magic. You just touch a little button and the book is right there on your tablet and money is gone from your account. <laughs> it 
It's just all magic. <coughs> and again, the guys that were selling books out of brick and mortar failed to transition with the paradigm shift. And the reason is because it is so incredibly painful to, to change the way we think about anything. And Jesus is consistently, I mean consistently, doing exactly that. Forcing us to think about things like worship, He will say. It used to be that worship would happen. Back to John 4. It used to be that worship would happen in Jerusalem. But the time is coming, Jesus says. The time is coming when the true worshiper and I'm paraphrasing. Bear with me. He says the true worshiper won't have to worship in a church building or in Jerusalem. He can worship wherever he wants to because that's the kind of worship God really wants. True worship is worship in spirit and in truth. I think that was such a radical shift in paradigm that in the 21st century... Christians are still trying to figure out exactly what that means. You look at our bulletins, and, and most of them will say that worship starts at 9.30 and ends at 10.30, or starts at 10.30 and ends at 11.30. We don't know for sure what to call Bible class, but we think maybe somebody might worship in there. But if they do, just kind of keep it, you know, on the QT. We don't... We don't want anything crazy. Worship going on, you know, from 9.30 to 10.30, but then worship starts at 10.30 and goes to 11.30, and it, and, it's, and it's here at the church building. Why is it that we're still using language like that? Why is it that Jesus has the authority to say, I am the Lord of the Sabbath? The Sabbath wasn't made for man. No, man wasn't made for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made... For man. There's two different paradigms. Um, one that's on its way out and one that's on its way in. The religion paradigm is uh, kind of goes like this. There's a system of deeds and observances that gain you favor with God. In other words, you do the right things, you sing the right songs, you pray the right prayers, you give enough money, you knock on enough doors, you preach enough sermons to sleepy people, and eventually God will say, Okay, John's all right. Okay? That's the... That's the religion. Not that, by the way, that wasn't you folks. I know you guys aren't sleepy. You're looking right at me. Many years ago in a, in a church far, far away, uh, one of the elders would sleep through my sermon and then um, every Sunday would come up to me and grab me by the hand and say, Good sermon, John. And I always wanted to you know, I felt led by the Spirit to squeeze his hand just a little bit harder than I did everybody else's. No. Um, deeds and observances that gain you favor with God. Uh, you do things to be loved and accepted. And rules are very important. That's the religion paradigm. The relationship paradigm is very different. And contrary to most people's belief, it functioned in a very real way even in the Old Testament. For instance, David, who of all of the guys with really bad behavior, David takes the prize. I mean, he was an horrific dad. He was immoral sexually. And yet God would say, and this is so bizarre, God would say, He's a man after my heart. What? David? I mean, when he's not killing people, he's 
having affairs. And you're going to say he's a man after your own heart? Yeah, see, the, the amazing thing is that God is much more interested in what's going on on the inside. That's not to say that our behavior is not important. Do you understand? Especially to the internet people. I understand. <laughs> behavior is important. Because I'll get emails on that one. But behavior is important, certainly. But God looks, God looks past all of that, thank God. You're already accepted and loved in this relationship paradigm. Deeds are in response to your acceptance. And rules just get in the way. You know, I, I, I was thinking about this. I, I have never been tempted, ever, to just say to Sabrina, you know what, I, I think Fridays from uh, 2 in the afternoon to 4 in the afternoon, we should just have spontaneous communication time. <laughs> Right? You know what she would say? She would say, what? That's, that's crazy. Right? Because you can't, you can't make spontaneous communication time happen between 2 and 4 o'clock. You have to kind of be, uh, what? Spontaneous. Yeah. There has to be, you know, so, I mean, and, and by the way, I've, I've counseled with, with couples and it, for some reason, it tends to be the guy who functions this way who says, you know, well, she's not going to do this, and she's going to do this, and if she spends any money, she's going to check with me. And, and, you know, and he's got this list of about 75 things, and I'm thinking, he has not figured out that relationships do not thrive in the context of rules. Why do we think that God wants a relationship with us based on the keeping of a bunch of rules and regulations? It just doesn't make sense. In fact, Jesus was a consistent... This is one that's going to get me in trouble too. Jesus was a consistent rule breaker. You know, I mean, there were so many rules that the Sadducees and Pharisees and the leaders had. And, and I mean, everything from the fact that you had to wash your hands ceremonially. Not when We have to wash our hands before we eat at our house. But it has nothing to do with religious stuff. It just has to do with the fact that you know, there's all sorts of germs on your hands and you should wash your hands. But in Jesus' day, they had to wash their hands ceremonially before they ate. And I want you to find me one time that Jesus ever washed his hands before he ate. And it infuriated these people. They were just going crazy over the fact that every time they turned around, his guys were picking grain in the, you know, in the fields on the Sabbath day, or he was healing some guy on the Sabbath day. You know why they killed him? They killed him because he mandated an absolutely mind-boggling paradigm shift that says God's much more interested in a relationship with you than he is in your behavior. He's not nearly as freaked out about your sin as you are. I don't have time to do this uh, slide right here. I just want to touch on a couple of these. It's, uh, it, it shows the difference between the religious paradigm and the relationship paradigm. And I could do a sermon on each one of these, uh, but, but I, I, I'm just going to touch on a few. Uh, under, under the religious paradigm, I obey, therefore I'm accepted. Under the gospel, the relationship paradigm, uh, there's a blood-spattered cross on a hill outside Jerusalem that says, I'm already accepted. And I don't perform to be accepted. I perform because I have been accepted. Because he says, that's my boy. And I say, just tell me what you want me to do. Right? I mean, when, when Caleb was playing ball, you know, we, we had a lot of talks 
before the beginning of the baseball season. And when I would whistle, you know, the boy would look around for what he was missing. And the reason that that worked is because he already knew. He was my boy whether he performed well on the field or not. And you know, Sabrina and I were sitting there and we were talking with the other parents and saying, yeah, that's, that's our guy right out there. Right? Even when he struck out, or even when his pitch went wild. Under the religion paradigm, you live in constant fear and insecurity. Under the gospel paradigm, you live with grateful joy. Under the religion paradigm, people are pushed. Under the gospel paradigm, they're drawn. Isn't that just so amazing? I mean, from the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, He wasn't driving people anywhere. They were flocking to hear Him. Under the religious paradigm, you obey to get stuff. Under the gospel paradigm, you obey to be near God and to be changed by Him. I'm going to skip some of these. Um, if you guys want a copy of them, I'll send them to you. Um, when we're criticized, the second one to the bottom there. When we're criticized, the world unravels and self-worth worth, um, is all about performance. And, I, you know, I see this all the time. I... I uh, I'm just amazed at how if if there are people in my sphere of influence that if, not in this group, by the way, but if, if they are confronted in any sense of the term, I mean, the day's done, it's over. Because they have to be right, they have to be um, perfect, or they have no self-worth. Under the gospel paradigm, I struggle, but my worth isn't tied to my ability to perform. What is my worth tied to? The fact that I'm God's kid. Uh, Self-view um, has wild swings under the religion paradigm. Uh, there's swagger some of the time and sniveling the rest of the time. But I love this one, the one at the very bottom. I'm so bad that He had to come and die for me. But He loved me so much that He was willing to do it. That creates both humility and confidence at the same time. Isn't that just amazing? I got another whole page of these, um, but we need to quit. We're out of time. In fact, the guests are probably thinking, man... Time for church to be over. I know it is. Jim's going to lead us an invitation song. If there's anything we can do to help you in your relationship with him, please don't leave. Let us know. We'd love to help. Jim, come lead us.